We can make ourselves heart attack proof. Coronary artery disease need not exist and if it does, it need not progress. The argument I still hear from physicians who do not embrace this truth is that they are certain their patients would not comply with such a strict nutrition program. I do not understand how they are so sure of this unless the patients are given a chance. In fact, after counseling patients with severe coronary artery disease for more than 20 years, I have found the opposite to be true. If you explain to a cardiac patient that there is a program that will quickly relieve or eradicate his pain that can eliminate any need for further intervention, no more bypass surgery, angioplasties or stents, that can heal and replenish the vascular system that has benefits that improve over time, the patient tends to pay attention. In my experience, in fact, like that distraught man on the cruise ship who heard me lecture, I can't believe no one told me there was another option. Many thoroughly resent the fact that no one ever told them the truth. Today I'm reading to you the highlights of Catwell Esselstyn's Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease, the revolutionary scientifically proven nutrition-based cure. This book has its origins in the dramatic experiences of 23 men and one woman who came to me in despair and without hope some 20 years ago. At the time, I was a surgeon at the renowned Cleveland Clinic. A surgeon has only so many tools to use against a lethal disease, and in the case of the patients to whom this book is dedicated, the clinic's physicians had found themselves in the position of having to say that there was nothing more they could do. Most demoralizing for those who had been the beneficiaries of the clinic's surgical interventions was the recognition that so much that had been done to save them, repeated open heart surgery, angioplasties aplenty, stents and a host of medications, seemed to no longer have any useful effect. Almost all the men had lost their sexual potency. Most had chest pains, the terrifying condition known as angina. For some it was so agonizing that they couldn't lie down and had to sleep sitting up. Only a few could take long walks and some couldn't even cross a room without excruciating pain. The fact is that some were walking dead men. Almost all of those who came to me, who had been told there was little hope, today, 20 years later, are alive, their arterial diseases receded. They stand as living proof of what is possible for you and anyone else who chooses to do what is necessary to become heart attack proof. Part 1. The heart of the matter. Eating to live. Quote, it was a Friday in November 1996. I had operated all day. I finished, said goodbye to my last patient and got a very, very bad headache. It hit me in a flash. I had to sit down. A minute or two after that, the chest pain started. It radiated up my arm and shoulder and into my jaw." Unquote. These are the words of Joe Crowey, the doctor who succeeded me as chairman of the Breast Cancer Task Force at the Cleveland Clinic. He was having a heart attack. He was only 44 years old. He had no family history of heart disease, was not overweight or diabetic and did not have high blood pressure or a bad cholesterol count. In short, he was not the usual candidate for a heart attack. Nonetheless, he had been struck and struck hard. Coronary artery disease is the leading killer of men and women in Western civilization. In the United States alone, more than half a million people die of it every single year. Three times that number suffer known heart attacks, and approximately three million more have silent heart attacks, experiencing minimal symptoms and having no idea, until well after the damage is done, that they are in mortal danger. In the course of a lifetime, one out of every two American men and one out of every three American women will have some form of the disease. Nearly all of that money is devoted to treating symptoms. It pays for cardiac drugs, for clot dissolving medications and for costly mechanical techniques that bypass clogged arteries or widen them with balloons, tiny rotating knives, lasers and stents. 
All of these approaches carry significant risk of serious complications, including death. And even if they are successful, they provide only temporary relief from the symptoms. They do nothing at all to cure the underlying disease or to prevent its development in other potential victims. The bottom line of the nutritional program I recommend is that it contains not a single item of any food known to cause or promote the development of vascular disease. Here are the rules of my program in their simplest form. You may not eat anything with a mother or a face, no meat, poultry or fish. You cannot eat dairy products. You must not consume oil of any kind, not a drop. Yes, you devotees of the Mediterranean diet that includes olive oil, as I'll explain in chapter 10. Generally, you cannot eat nuts or avocados. You can eat a wonderful variety of delicious, nutrient-dense foods. All vegetables except avocado, leafy green vegetables, root vegetables, veggies that are red, green, purple, orange and yellow and everything in between. All legumes, beans, peas and lentils of all varieties. All whole grains and products such as bread and pasta that are made from them, as long as they do not contain added fats. All fruits. It works. In the first continuous 12-year study of the effects of nutrition in severely ill patients, which I will describe in this book, those who complied with my program achieved total arrest of clinical progression and significant selective reversal of coronary artery disease. In fully compliant patients, we have seen angina disappear in a few weeks and abnormal stress test results return to normal. The dietary changes that have helped my patients over the past 20 years can help you too. They can actually make you immune to heart attacks. And there is considerable evidence that they have benefits far beyond coronary artery disease. If you eat to save your heart, you eat to save yourself from other diseases of nutritional extravagance, from strokes, hypertension, obesity, osteoporosis, adult onset diabetes, and possibly senile mental impairment as well. You gain protection from a host of other ailments that have been linked to dietary factors, including impotence and cancers of the breast, prostate, colon, rectum, uterus and ovaries. And if you are eating for good health in this way, here's a side benefit you might not have expected. For the rest of your life, you will never again have to count calories or worry about your weight. Dr. Lewis Kuller of the University of Pittsburgh recently reported the 10-year findings of the Cardiovascular Health Study, a project of the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute. His conclusion is startling. All males over 65 years of age exposed to a traditional Western lifestyle have cardiovascular disease and should be treated as such. Systemic treatment of disease through aggressive reduction of cholesterol is clearly superior to selective intervention at a single site where an artery has been clogged and narrowed. Sustained nutrition changes and, when necessary, low doses of cholesterol-reducing medication will offer maximum protection from vascular disease. Anyone who follows the program faithfully will almost certainly see no further progression of the disease and will very likely find that it selectively regresses. The benefits of intervention erode with the passage of time. Eventually, you have to have another angioplasty, another bypass procedure, another stent. By contrast, the benefits of my program actually grow with time. The longer you follow it, the healthier you will be. Someday, we'll have to get smarter. You looked at a map of the world and almost all the chronic ailments like coronary disease were crowded into the western countries. Then there were all these other countries, especially in Asia and Africa, where those diseases hardly showed up at all. For example, women in the United States were 20 times more likely than women in Kenya to develop breast cancer. And in the early 1950s, breast cancer was almost unknown in Japan. Later, the rates began to rise as the Japanese adopted lifestyles and eating habits more like those of affluent Westerners. A close look at the cultures with low rates of breast 
cancer showed an obvious common denominator, a low intake of dietary fat and correspondingly low cholesterol levels. The same was true for cancers of the colon, prostate and ovary, and for diabetes and obesity. In those parts of the world where coronary artery disease is rare, diets are low in fat and serum cholesterol levels are consistently below 150 mg per deciliter. Average cholesterol levels hover around 200 mg per deciliter. Autopsies of soldiers during the Korean and Vietnam wars showed the effects of America's artery-clogging diet even on the very young. The arteries of Asian soldiers were largely clean, free of fatty deposits. But almost 80% of American battlefield casualties showed gross evidence of coronary artery disease, clogging and damage that, had the soldiers lived, would have grown worse with every passing decade. Simply stated, just as you need stone to build a stone wall, you need a specific level of fat and cholesterol in your bloodstream to narrow and clog your arteries with atherosclerosis. When the cholesterol carried in the bloodstream reaches unsafe levels, fat and cholesterol are deposited on the linings of the blood vessels. These deposits are called plaques. Old plaques may contain scar tissue and calcium and can steadily enlarge, severely narrowing and sometimes blocking the arteries. A significantly narrowed artery cannot supply the heart muscle with adequate blood. Heart muscle deprived of normal blood supply causes chest pain or angina. Most people think that it is the vessels finally closing off, completely blocked by a large old plaque that causes a heart attack or myocardial infarction. Wrong. That process actually accounts for only about 12% of deaths from heart attacks. The most recent scientific evidence shows that most heart attacks are caused by younger fatty plaques, plaques too small to cause the overt symptoms that ordinarily bring on mechanical interventions like angioplasty. Here's what happens. The lining that covers such plaques ruptures and the fatty deposits inside leach out into the bloodstream. The body responds by rushing its clotting forces to repair the injury. When the clotting process succeeds, the entire artery may clot and close, thus completely depriving an area of heart muscle of its blood supply, causing it to die. If a person survives such an attack, the dead portion of heart muscle scars. Multiple heart attacks and widespread scarring weaken the heart, sometimes causing it to fail, a condition called congestive heart failure. If a heart attack is extensive, if it disrupts rhythmical contraction, or if congestive heart failure is prolonged, the victim may die. The development of the disease is not like, say, a bee sting, in which the relationship between cause and effect is quite obvious. It may require decades of self-injury from a high-fat diet before clinical symptoms develop. By the late 1970s, I was certain that there was a strong connection between nutrition and many diseases. The connection with heart disease seemed most obvious. First, there was the compelling fact that in nations where blood levels of cholesterol were customarily below 150 mg per deciliter, coronary artery disease was rare, while in places where the levels were higher, so was the incidence of heart disease. In addition, the earliest scientific studies, which have been consistently confirmed by the most recent research, showed that a diet high in fat and cholesterol causes coronary artery disease in animals and humans. Seeking the cure. The group included 23 men and one woman. They agreed to follow a plant-based diet. It turned out that between 9 and 11% of the calories they consumed on that diet were derived from fat. I asked them to eliminate from their diet almost all dairy products. In the beginning I allowed them to have skim milk and non-fat yogurt, but have since eliminated all dairy products because of the potential tumor-causing properties of casein and the contribution of animal protein to the process of atherosclerosis. All oil and all fish, fowl and meat. 
I encouraged them to eat grains, legumes, lentils, vegetables and fruit. I asked them to keep daily food diaries listing everything they consumed, recommended that they take a daily multivitamin and suggested that they moderate their consumption of alcohol and caffeine. I did not require participants in the study to commit to any extra measures, such as exercise or meditation. There are several reasons for that. For one, it was my observation that in those cultures where coronary disease does not exist, it was diet and low cholesterol, not exercise habit or personal tranquility, that were responsible for warding it off. A primer on heart disease. The goal of my study was to use a combination of nutrition and cholesterol reducing drugs to get the cholesterol levels of each and every one of my patients below 150 mg per deciliter and then to see what effect that reduction would have on their coronary artery disease. I chose that particular target threshold for a number of reasons. For one, there was the clarion example of those parts in the world where cardiovascular disease is nearly non-existent. In those areas, cholesterol levels are consistently below 150 mg per deciliter. Cornell University professor Emeritus Colin Campbell, an expert in biochemistry and nutrition, was the director of a 20-year project that involved Cornell, Oxford University and the Chinese Academy of Preventative Medicine, one of the most comprehensive studies of, of nutrition ever. Among other things, the project found that the normal range of cholesterol among residents of rural China, where coronary artery disease is rarely seen, falls between 90 and 150 mg per deciliter. Cholesterol is a white waxy substance that is not found in plants, only in animals. It is an essential component of the membrane that coats all our cells and it is the basic ingredient of sex hormones. Our bodies need cholesterol and they manufacture it on their own. We do not need to eat it. But we do when we consume meat, poultry, fish and other animal-based foods such as dairy products and eggs. Eating fat causes the body itself to manufacture excessive amounts of cholesterol which explains why vegetarians who eat oil, butter, cheese, milk, ice cream, glazed donuts and French pastry develop coronary disease despite their avoidance of meat. Medicine subdivides cholesterol into two types. High density lipoprotein or HDL is sometimes known as good cholesterol. Medical experts do not know precisely how but it seems to offer some protection against heart attacks by collecting excess cholesterol and carrying it away from the arteries to the liver, which can break it down and dispose of it. As total blood cholesterol rises, you need more and more of the HDL cholesterol to protect you against heart disease. Low density lipoprotein or LDL is bad cholesterol. When too much of it is present in the bloodstream, it tends to build up along artery walls, helping to form the plaques that narrow blood vessels and ultimately may clog them to altogether. Healthy arteries are strong and elastic, their linings smooth and unobstructed, allowing a free flow of blood. But when the levels of fat in the bloodstream become elevated, everything begins to change. Gradually, the endothelium, the white blood cells and the platelets, the blood cells that cause clotting, all become sticky. Eventually, a white blood cell adheres to and eventually penetrates the endothelium, where it attempts to ingest the rising numbers of LDL cholesterol molecules that are being oxidized from the fatty diet. That white blood cell sends out a call for help to other white blood cells. More and more of them converge on the site, becoming engorged with bad cholesterol and eventually forming a bubble of fatty pus, an atheroma or plaque, the chief characteristic of atherosclerosis. Old plaques contain scar tissue and calcium. As they enlarge, they severely narrow and sometimes block the arteries. A significantly narrowed artery cannot give the heart muscle a normal blood supply and the heart muscles thus deprived causes chest pain or angina. 
in some cases, the coronary arteries actually perform their own bypasses, growing extra branches called collaterals that go around the narrowed vessels. However, it is not the old larger plaques that put you most at risk for heart attacks. The most recent scientific evidence indicates that most heart attacks occur when younger and smaller fatty plaques rupture their outer lining or cap and bleed into the coronary artery. As the plaque is formed, a fibrous cap develops as its roof, which is covered by a single layer of endothelium about as thick as a cobweb. The white blood cells that raced to the rescue now engorged with oxidized LDL cholesterol are called foam cells and begin to manufacture chemical substances that erode the cap of the plaque. The cap weakens to the thickness of a cobweb and eventually the shearing force of blood flowing over the weakened cap may cause it to rupture. This is catastrophic. Plaque content or pus now oozes into the flowing bloodstream and that constitutes a thrombogenic event. Nature wants to heal the rupture and so platelets are activated. They try mightily to stop the invading garbage by clotting the rupture. Thus begins a lethal cascade. The clot is self-propagating and within minutes the entire artery may become blocked. With no more blood flowing through the blocked artery, the heart muscle that was nourished by it begins to die. This is the definition of myocardial infarction or heart attack. If the person survives this attack, the dead portion of heart muscle scars. Multiple heart attacks and widespread scarring weaken the heart, sometimes causing it to fail. That condition is known as congestive heart failure. If the heart attack is extensive, if it results in an abnormal rhythmical contraction, or if the congestive heart failure is prolonged, the person may die. If the same process of plaque formation occurs in a non-coronary artery, it can be just as dangerous. Whatever tissue the artery supplies, it could be the leg muscle or even the brain, will not receive its full measure of blood. What's more, a piece of a plaque or a clot can break loose and be carried through the bloodstream, ultimately obstructing an artery far from its source. This is it. If you follow a plant-based nutrition program to reduce your total cholesterol level to below 150 mg per deciliter and the LDL level to less than 80 mg per deciliter, you cannot deposit fat and cholesterol into your coronary arteries. Moderation kills. In early 2006, a report published in the Journal of the American Medical Association resulted in national headlines suggesting that low-fat diets do not decrease health risks. The JAMA article was based on a study part of the Women's Health Initiative of the National Institutes of Health, which followed nearly 49,000 women over eight years and it found that those prescribed a quote-unquote low-fat diet turned out to have the same rates of heart attacks, strokes and cancers of the breast and colon as those who ate whatever they wanted. Almost buried in the news reports about this latest, largest, most extensive study ever was this incredibly important fact. The women who were supposedly consuming a low-fat diet were actually getting 29% of their daily calories from fat. For those on the front lines of nutritional research, that is not low fat at all. It is three times the level, around 10% of daily caloric intake, that researchers like me recommend through plant-based nutrition. Let's review what we know about the science. Heart disease, as I have already stressed, develops in susceptible persons when blood cholesterol levels rise higher than 150 mg per deciliter. The converse is also true. A person who maintains blood cholesterol under 150 mg per deciliter for a lifetime will not develop coronary artery disease, even if he or she smokes, has a family history of coronary disease, suffers from hypertension and is obese. Nutrition impinges on cardiovascular health in several critical ways. The most obvious, of course, is that a diet high in fat and cholesterol causes blood lipid levels to rise, thus setting off the process of plaque formation. 
but isn't, quote, dietary moderation, unquote, enough to stop that process? If you cut back considerably on fat and cholesterol, shouldn't you be all right, as my colleagues suggested? Surely just a little bit won't hurt. Wrong. Every segment of our bodies is comprised of cells and every individual cell is protected by an outer coat. This cell membrane is almost unimaginably delicate, just one hundred thousandth of a millimeter thick. Yet it is absolutely essential to the integrity and healthy functioning of the cell. And it is extremely vulnerable to injury. Every mouthful of oils and animal products, including dairy foods, initiates an assault on those membranes and therefore on the cells they protect. These foods produce a cascade of free radicals in our bodies, especially harmful chemical substances that induce metabolic injuries from which there is only partial recovery. Year after year, the effects accumulate and eventually the cumulative cell injury is great enough to become obvious to express itself as what physicians define as disease. Plants and grains do not induce the deadly cascade of free radicals. Even better, in fact, they carry an antidote. Unlike oils and animal products, they contain antioxidants, which help to neutralize the free radicals and also, recent research suggests, may provide considerable protection against cancers. The endothelial cells make nitric oxide, which is critical to preserving the tone and health of the blood vessels. Nitric oxide is a vasodilator, that is, it causes the vessels to dilate or enlarge. When there is abundant nitric oxide in the bloodstream, it keeps blood flowing as if the vessel's surfaces were coated with the most slippery Teflon, eliminating the stickiness of vessels and blood cells that is caused by high lipid levels that in turn lead to plaque formation. The answer lies in the effect of fat on the endothelium's ability to produce nitric oxide. Dr. Fogel closely monitored endothelial function of subjects and found that two hours after eating a fatty meal, there was a significant drop. It took nearly six hours, in fact, for endothelial function to get back to normal. Plant-based nutrition, it turns out, has a mighty beneficial effect on endothelial cells, those metabolic and biochemical dynamos that produce nitric oxide. And nitric oxide, as I have noted, is absolutely essential to vascular health, a finding that won the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 1998. 1. It relaxes blood vessels, selectively boosting blood flow to the organs that need it. 2. It prevents white blood cells and platelets from becoming sticky and thus starting the buildup of vascular plaque. 3. It keeps the smooth muscle cells of arteries from growing into plaques. 4. It may even help to diminish vascular plaques once they are in place. The essential building block for nitric oxide production is a substance called L-arginine, an amino acid that is in rich supply in a variety of plant foods, especially legumes, beans, soy and nuts. There is a competitor for nitric oxide synthesis, asymmetric dimethyl arginine or ADMA, which is manufactured by our bodies in the course of normal protein metabolism. When we have too much ADMA, then L-arginine is edged out for a position in nitric oxide synthesis, and the production of nitric oxide fails. There is another delicate enzyme with a formidable name, dimethyl arginine dimethyl amino hydrolase, or DDAH, that destroys ADMA in order to favor production of nitric oxide. But the usual cardiovascular risk factors, high cholesterol, high triglycerides, high homocysteine, insulin resistance, hypertension, and tobacco use, all impair the ability of that delicate enzyme to destroy ADMA. Along the way, they also reduce symptoms such as angina pectoris, chest pain, perhaps the most frightening and incapacitating symptom of heart disease. Normally, physical effort or strong emotion causes the endothelium to go into action, producing nitric oxide, dilating the blood vessels and thus boosting the flow of blood to the heart muscle. 
but in a patient with coronary disease, the endothelium's capacity is badly diminished. His narrowed coronary arteries do not dilate and therefore his heart muscle does not receive the blood flow it needs. The result? Pain. It may be mild or it may be excruciating. Many patients become cardiac cripples, terrified of exerting themselves physically, of making love, of expressing or experiencing strong emotions. Living Breathing Proof among the fully compliant patients during the 12-year study, there was not one further clinical episode of worsening coronary artery disease after they committed themselves to keeping cholesterol within the safe range. All of these patients have continued on their own to follow the nutritional program and cholesterol-lowering medication I recommended, even though the study has ended. Why didn't anyone tell me? It is hard to believe, but for decades it was the conventional wisdom that blood levels of cholesterol up to 300 mg per deciliter were perfectly normal. Most recently, national health organizations, the American Heart Association, the National Cholesterol Education Program and the National Research Council have decreed that serum cholesterol should be below 200 mg per deciliter. These same organizations suggest limiting fat consumption to no more than 30% of the calories consumed each day, but that level of fat consumption has never been shown to arrest or reverse coronary artery disease. We have known for a long time that one out of every four persons who have heart attacks has a blood cholesterol level between 180 and 210 mg per deciliter and we know that more than a third of those in the Framingham Heart Study who had heart disease showed cholesterol levels between 150 and 200 mg per deciliter. That means that millions of Americans who are doing the best they can to meet the standards set by national health officials are, in spite of their efforts, getting sick. Simple steps. Here, once again, is the basic message of my research. No one who achieves and maintains total blood cholesterol of 150 mg per deciliter and LDL levels below 80 mg per deciliter using strict plant-based nutrition and where necessary low doses of cholesterol reducing drugs experiences progression of heart disease. Many in fact are able to rejoice at clear medical evidence that they have actually reversed the effects of their disease. Your cholesterol metabolism and with it your resistance to the insidious progression of heart disease can come to resemble those of the rural Chinese, the residents of Okinawa, the Tarahumara Indians of northern Mexico, the Papua Highlanders of New Guinea and many native Africans. Among these peoples, because of the plant-based diets they have always consumed, heart disease is virtually unknown. My first request is that patients and their families eliminate from their vocabulary, from their thinking, from their most basic belief systems, the phrase, this little bit can't hurt. If you have retained only one fact from my explanations of the science behind this program, I hope it is this, that just a little bit of forbidden food, fats, dairy products, oils, animal proteins can hurt and will. Think of it this way. If you adopt a healthy diet overall but allow yourself to have fats just two or three times a week, that means you are abusing and injuring yourself on 150 or so days of the year. This quote unquote moderation rationale will deprive you of the ultimate health benefits of plant-based nutrition. Just this little bit is enough to prevent you from remaining free of heart disease. The foods to avoid. 1. Anything with a face or a mother. This includes meat, poultry, fish and eggs. 2. Dairy products. That means butter, cheese, cream, ice cream, yogurt and milk, even skim milk. 3. Oils. All oils, including virgin olive oil and canola oil. 4. Refined grains. These, unlike whole grains, have been stripped of much of their fiber and nutrients. 
you should avoid white rice and enriched flour products, which are found in many pastas, breads, bagels and baked goods. 5. Nuts Those who have heart disease should avoid all nuts. Those without disease can consume walnuts in moderation because they can provide considerable omega-3 fatty acids, which are important for many essential bodily functions. But I am extremely wary of nuts. Although short-term studies funded by nut companies show that they may positively affect good and bad cholesterol, I know of no long-term studies indicating that they can arrest and reverse heart disease and patients may easily over-ingest them, elevating their cholesterol levels. Now for the foods that you are allowed, in fact encouraged, to consume. 1. Vegetables This is by no means a complete list, but it gives you a good sense of the wide variety of vegetables that you can eat. Sweet potatoes, yams, potatoes, but never french fried or prepared in any other way that involves adding fats. Broccoli, kale and spinach. Asparagus, artichokes, eggplant, radishes, celery, onions, carrots. Brussels sprouts, corn, cabbages, lettuces, peppers. Bok choy, Swiss chard and beet greens turnips and parsnips, summer squashes, winter squashes, tomatoes, although strictly speaking tomatoes are fruit, cucumbers. Almost any vegetable you can imagine is legal on this plan, with a single exception for cardiac patients, avocados, which carry a high fat content, unusual for vegetables. Those without heart disease can eat avocados as long as their blood lipid levels are not elevated. 2. Legumes beans, peas and lentils of all kinds. This is a wide-ranging family of plants and you are almost certain to discover delicious varieties you may never have encountered before embarking on this nutrition plan. 3. Whole grains Whole wheat, whole rye, bulgur wheat, whole oats, barley, buckwheat, kasha or buckwheat groats, Whole corn, cornmeal, white rice, brown rice, popcorn and less well-known whole grains such as couscous, kamut, a relative of durum wheat, quinoa, amaranth, millet, spelt, teff, triticale, grano and farro. There is a marvelous variety of choices, both familiar and new. You can also eat cereals that do not contain added sugar and oils. Old-fashioned oats, for instance, not the quick cooking variety, shredded wheat, and brand names like grape nuts. Breads should be whole grain and should not contain added oil. Whole grain pastas are allowed, those made from whole wheat, brown rice, spelt and quinoa. Be careful about restaurant pasta. It is often egg-based and made from white flour and there may well be oil lurking in the marinara sauce. 4. Fruit Fruits of all varieties are permitted. A word of caution is in order, however, it is preferable to limit your fruit consumption to three pieces a day or for berries and grapes, three servings, each about the size of a modest handful. It is also best to avoid drinking pure fruit juices. Fruit and juice especially carries a high sugar content and consuming too much of it rapidly raises the blood sugar. The body compensates to the sugar high with a surge of insulin from the pancreas and the insulin in turn stimulates the liver to manufacture more cholesterol. It may also elevate triglyceride levels. Be careful of sugar-laden desserts, which can have the same effect. 5. Beverages Water, salsa water, try adding a small amount of fruit juice to boost flavor, oat milk, no-fat soy milk, coffee and tea. And alcohol is just fine in moderation. Consuming the full range of plant-based nutrition does not require supplemental calcium or a multivitamin. However, for all those who are consuming plant-based nutrition, I recommend the following supplements. 1. Vitamin B12. I favor 1000 micrograms daily. 2. Vitamin D3. Check your blood level. If your blood level is normal, it is not needed. If your blood level is below normal, I suggest 1000 to 2000 international units daily until the low normal blood level is reached. Adjust dosage then to maintain the low normal range. 3. Omega-3 fatty acids. 
You can fulfill your daily requirement by consuming one to two tablespoons of flaxseed meal or one to two tablespoons of chia seeds each day, perhaps by sprinkling it over cereal. Be sure to refrigerate flaxseed meal. 4. Cholesterol lowering drugs. These must be taken under a physician's supervision. Why not just use the diet for a number of months and add the cholesterol reducing drug only if it is needed to force the cholesterol below the 150 mg per deciliter threshold? With severe coronary disease, we don't always have the luxury of time. It is essential to start the healing of the endothelium, that vulnerable inner lining of the coronary arteries, as rapidly and completely as possible. Used as adjuncts to the nutrition plan, these remarkable statin drugs help to do just that. But remember, the drugs alone are not enough. In chapter 5 I cited a study recently reported in the New England Journal of Medicine in which huge doses of statins successfully reduced patients' cholesterol levels well below 150 mg per deciliter. But even so, as their diet never changed, one out of four of the subjects experienced a new cardiovascular event or died within 30 months. Frequently asked questions. I have experienced this phenomenon myself and watched it in every patient with whom I've worked. After 12 weeks of eating no animal foods, dairy or added oils, you lose your craving for fat. You then begin to appreciate more than ever before the natural flavor of grains, vegetables, legumes and fruit. No fat deficiencies have been identified in people who eat a variety of plant-based foods. Overall, a diet made up of the foods on the approved list in Chapter 8 will contain approximately 10% fat. That level represents a significant departure from the 37% fat content of the typical Western diet, but it is ideal for good health. This diet will not cause a protein deficiency. Typically, the Western diet contains an excess of protein, especially animal protein. The nutrition plan I recommend provides a variety of healthy plant proteins, somewhere between 50 and 70 grams every day. The first thing I do when people tell me that they can't reduce their cholesterol to 150 mg per deciliter or less is press them on precisely what they eat on Friday or Saturday nights or what they might have consumed at that seemingly endless weekday meeting where there was quote nothing else to eat. Unquote. Often, under my questioning, they reveal tiny deviations from the nutrition program, lapses so small that they didn't even take them into account. Why can't I have quote unquote heart healthy oils? Between 14 and 17 percent of olive oil is saturated artery clogging fat, every bit as aggressive in promoting heart disease as the saturated fat in roast beef. And even though a Mediterranean style diet that allows such oils may slow the rate of progression of coronary artery disease, when compared with diets even higher in saturated fat, it does not arrest the disease and reverse its effects. There is no question that the group consuming the Mediterranean style diet did not fare nearly as badly as those in the control group. But there is another way to look at the results of the Lyon diet heart study. By the end of the study, nearly four years after its start, fully 25% of the subjects on the Mediterranean diet, one out of four, had either died or experienced some new cardiovascular event. In 1997, Colin Campbell, author of the best-selling China study, was asked his thoughts on the results of the Lyon diet heart study and to compare those results with those he found in studying health and nutrition in rural China, where coronary disease is practically non-existent. Colin didn't hesitate for a moment. The Mediterranean and rural Chinese diets are practically the same, he replied. I would say the absence of oil in the rural Chinese diet is the reason for their superior success. Kindred spirits 
it is worth noting that two of my patients who had had moderately disabling strokes before the study began did no exercise at all. Yet like others, they had excellent results that have lasted more than 20 years since the start of the study. Patients with coronary artery disease who cannot exercise must not despair. Full adherence to the nutrition program will protect them from progression of their disease. My colleague Dean Ornish succinctly sums up the dilemma faced by those of us who believe in this healthy way of eating. Quote, I don't understand why asking people to eat a well-balanced vegetarian diet is considered drastic while it is medically conservative to cut people open. Unquote. Brave New World There are two types of stroke. In hemorrhagic stroke, the less common of the two, a blood vessel in the brain ruptures because of high blood pressure or a genetic weakness of the vessel wall, known as an aneurysm. A plant-based diet cannot do anything to cure a genetic aneurysm, but it will definitely help reduce blood pressure, an important step in the right direction. On the more common variety of stroke, ischemic or embolic stroke, there is even better news. These have the same origin as coronary artery disease. An ischemic stroke occurs when fat and cholesterol block blood vessels that carry oxygen and nutrients to the brain, just as they may block the coronary arteries that nourish the heart. An embolic stroke also deprives the brain of nutrients and oxygen, but in a slightly different way. When an artery sheds part of its diseased inner lining, that debris, called an embolus, is carried through the bloodstream until it gets wedged into a blood vessel that is too small for it to traverse. Now it blocks the flow of blood through that vessel. This may happen almost anywhere in the body, blocking blood flow to a kidney, an intestine, a leg, or some other organ. When it occurs in vessels that nourish the brain, it is a stroke. The buildup of fatty plaques in blood vessels can cause damage in many different ways. For example, when an aorta that contains plaque is clamped during coronary bypass surgery, plaque debris is loosened and enters the bloodstream as an embolus. Using ultrasound to monitor the middle cerebral artery in the brain, technicians can distinctly hear the embolizing plaque as it enters the brain. If the patient dies during surgery, the plaque debris may be found in the brain at autopsy. This tragic sequence helps explain the fearful loss of cognition in coronary artery bypass patients. Neuroradiologists also report that using magnetic resonance imaging, they can detect little white spots in the brains of Americans starting at about age 50. These spots represent small asymptomatic strokes. The brain has so much reserve capacity that at first these tiny strokes cause no trouble. But if they continue, they begin to cause memory loss and ultimately crippling dementia. In fact, one recently reported study found that the presence of these silent brain infarcts more than doubles the risk of dementia. We now believe, in fact, that at least half of all senile mental impairment is caused by vascular injury to the brain. A study in the Netherlands focused on 5,000 people between the ages of 55 and 94. The researchers studied the circulation in the brains of all their subjects, then asked them to perform various written tests of mental acuity. The results were quite clear. Those suffering from artery disease and thus impaired circulation in the brain performed less well on the tests than did those whose arteries were clean. Age made no difference. Arterial health was the, was the variable that counted. This should come as no surprise. Clogged arteries serving the brain and clogged arteries serving the heart are part and parcel of the same disease. Your aorta, along with all your other arteries, can be as clean at 90 years of age as they were when you were 9. The men who were impotent before the study began or who developed it during the study were 45% more likely to experience a cardiovascular event than those free of erectile dysfunction. Impotence, it turns out, is as robust a predictor of cardiovascular disease as elevated cholesterol, smoking, or a strong family history of the disease. 
If we are to shift the survival curve significantly to the right for a rectangular survival curve, we need to overcome chronic diseases. No longer would chronic illness precipitate the sad decline of later years. Instead, all would be well until naturally all systems eventually shut down. You are in control. We can make ourselves heart attack proof. Coronary artery disease need not exist, and if it does, it need not progress. The argument I still hear from physicians who do not embrace this truth is that they are certain their patients would not comply with such a strict nutrition program. I do not understand how they are so sure of this unless the patients are given a chance. In fact, after counseling patients with severe coronary artery disease for more than 20 years, I have found the opposite to be true. If you explain to a cardiac patient that there is a program that will quickly relieve or eradicate his pain that can eliminate any need for further intervention, no more bypass surgery, angioplasties or stents, that can heal and replenish the vascular system that has benefits that improve over time, the patient tends to pay attention. In my experience, in fact, like that distraught man on the cruise ship who heard me lecture I can't believe no one told me there was another option. Many thoroughly resent the fact that no one ever told them the truth. I imagine a widespread use of the brachial artery tunicat test, BART, which Dr. Robert Fogel used to such devastating effect to prove the vascular damage a single meal can cause. If public schools were forced to serve only meals that are barred positive, i.e. maintaining not normal artery dilation, if restaurants were required to inform us which menu items are barred positive and which are barred negative, if the labeling on all packaged foods carried information on their barred status, we would have gone a long way toward enlightening citizens and helping them make informed choices about enhancing or destroying their health. Part 2. The Joy of Eating Simple Strategies At this point, if you are like most of the patients I see in person, you are probably thinking something like this. How on earth will I be able to give up cheeseburgers, french fries, steak, mayonnaise, cheese, olive oil and all the other things I love? One friend of mine, a lawyer, was so put off by the idea of giving up all those foods that he asked me whether he couldn't keep eating his high-fat diet until he developed symptoms of coronary artery disease and then stop eating fat. I dissuaded him from this approach by explaining that in fully one out of four patients with heart disease, the first symptom is sudden death. The truth is that we are addicted to fat, literally. Receptors in our brains account for our addiction to nicotine, heroin and cocaine and similar cravings have been identified for fat and sugars as well. The way to break the fat habit is to abstain entirely from eating it, just as those who use heroin, cocaine and nicotine must give them up once and for all. We have all seen what happens with many people who go on reduced fat diets in order to lose weight. A diet that permits even a modest amount of animal dairy and oil fat still feeds the habit. The craving remains. And the moment the diet is completed, or more often fails, the diet had too frequently returns to his or her old habits of eating and regains the lost weight. One group continued eating a typically high-fat American diet. The second ate a diet in which fat was reduced to 20% of total calories. In the third group's diet, the fat level was held to 15% or less. At the end of 12 weeks, the first two groups craved fat just as much as ever, but those who had eaten less than 15% dietary fat over that period had completely lost their desire for fat. You are craving fat. Have faith. As I explained above, that craving will disappear after three months of consuming no fat. By no fat, I mean no animal, dairy or oil fat. No additional fat beyond the natural amounts in vegetables, fruits and grains. You will develop a new taste for the natural flavors of food and you'll discover new herbs, spices and sauces for seasoning. 
Eating safely in this culture is a daily challenge, but attention to detail assures success. Advice from Anne Cryl Assetston. If you have heart disease or you never want to develop it, it is critical to grasp these absolute rules. The rules. 1. Do not eat meat. 2. Do not eat chicken, even white meat. 3. Do not eat fish. 4. Do not eat any dairy products. That means no skim milk, no non-fat yogurt, no sherbet, and no cheese at all. 5. Do not eat eggs. That includes egg whites and even egg substitutes that contain egg whites. 6. Do not use any oil at all. Not even virgin olive oil or canola oil. 7. Use only whole grain products. That means no white flour products. Be sure the list of ingredients uses a phrase like whole wheat or whole grain. Avoid semolina and wheat flour, which are actually white. Use brown rice. 8. Do not drink fruit juice. It is fine to eat fruit or to use small amounts of fruit juice in recipes or to flavor beverages. 9. Do not eat any nuts. Although if you have no heart disease, you can occasionally have walnuts. 10. Do not eat avocados. That includes guacamole. 11. Do not eat coconut. 12. Eat soy products cautiously. Many are highly processed and high in fat. Use light tofu. Avoid soy cheese, which almost always contains oil and casein. A few words about salt. We do not use it. And we do not include it in our recipes, since most of my husband's patients have cardiovascular disease and hypertension, and salt may cause further injury. We have found that most patients readily adjust to the natural flavor of a plant-based diet without salt. If you are eating a plant-based, no-oil, whole-grain diet filled with leafy greens and all the colorful vegetables, you don't need to worry about weight. No calculations or calorie counting will be necessary. Almost everyone loses weight with the diet change. However, if you let whole grains, starchy vegetables and desserts dominate, weight can begin to creep back. If that happens, simply cut back on grains and starches, increase your consumption of leafy greens and colorful vegetables and cut out desserts. And that concludes my highlights of this very helpful book and a nutrition program truly to live by. So I hope you got something out of it and stay healthy.